was built, uh, started in 1899, completed in 1900. Um, it is on a state national registry, so um, it's called the Harmony House today, and we love the interior. But um, the Webster Museum, the Web Village Historic Preservation Commission, and also the town and museum have a historic properties committee. We all wanted to get Steve, where's Steve? Right. We wanted to get Steve out to do a talk, and this is a talk he hasn't done before, but he's been researching it for 30 years, and wow. it's from dance floors. This isn't one of them. Um, he can probably mention that. Yeah. This one doesn't bounce. But um, he's, got, he's a wealth of knowledge, this guy. He's been working in preservation since he graduated from Cornell. And that's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he does uh, window restoration for old windows, which we've had him do some of ours. Um, to keep, you know, the old ones will last longer than the new ones. And he, he just, he's written books, he's written articles for this old house for years, and I'd like to introduce Steve Jordan.
Um, it was really important in early America if you were a person of means. Thomas Jefferson or George Washington. That you knew how to dance and that you knew how to dance very well, okay? And, and, and people of means often took lessons so as not to be embarrassed as they became of age to go to dances. Um, George Washington was said to be a very aggressive and fine dancer, right?
has a strong floor. I'm going to come back to this a little bit later and tell you why and how it's framed, but not yet, okay? Here, here's pictures of the interior, okay? Uh, this is where the band would play. Would have had a big chandelier right in the middle of the room. Steel springs, still used for parties, okay? Mm -hmm. So we, we had our own nice venues here. One of them is the Phoenix building, okay? It was the hotel in Pittsburgh. Uh, Daniel Webster, Wood Clinton, I think Marquis Lafayette were people that stayed here. Some of them may have danced here. It definitely had a strong floor on the third floor. Uh, Andrew Wolf, who owned the newspaper, these regional newspapers in the area, uh, we had that building, I believe, in the 60s, and he told me we fixed the floor so that it was no longer paint. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's true. The Sprint House on Monroe Avenue had a, sprung, had a sprung floor. It was not called a Spring House because of the sprung floor. It was built on the spring, okay? But it also had one. And I should say to you really quickly, uh, I don't know how many of you know Ms. Jean France, who is an architectural historian here in, in the city. She, she cleared this up the first day I mentioned it to her. It is not a spring floor, young man. <laughs> it's a sprung floor. She was right about that. <laughs> <laughs> Where, what level is it? I know if that's well, that, that first or second. Third floor of that building. Third? Oh, um, third floor of the spring house. Oh, I never Okay. It's not the third floor. But it's divided up. So, yes, it was. It's divided up. Okay. That's what happens to all of them. They get divided up. Yeah. All right. Um, one of the most notable in our area, I mean, there were a lot of them here, but the Oliver Culver House, which was at East Avenue at Culver Road, and was later moved to its East Boulevard location. Uh, you see this room? You see that arch ceiling? Okay. So that was the ballroom, and it runs all the way across the front half up here. When I visited, it was owned by Miss Hollihan of the Rochester Historical Society, and I tried to take a picture, and she nearly threw me out of the house. Okay. She, she wasn't an easy woman to love. Uh, so I, I have no pictures of that that ballroom, and now it's a plastic surgeon's office. Uh, that just happened. I'm coming back to this. Okay. Uh, another early ballroom, you can see the inside, okay, in very bad condition. This is the old tavern, it's a restaurant now. I think this has been fixed up at this point. But this is the old tavern in Manchester, Vermont. Very early, sprung full, had a sprung full. Other, other examples. And these are typical of here. They hadn't been divided into bedrooms. They, they seem to all have some sort of arched or electrical ceiling. This one is more of a half circle. This one still has its bandstand. Okay. Uh, usually there was a chandelier. There were usually uh, benches. You see the bench? Common in all of these. Uh, normally there would have been a fireplace one end and later there might have been wood stoves at one end. Okay. This 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 is Valentine Hall in uh, Victor. It does not have a sprung floor, but because this is an absolutely pristine, intact ballroom, I wanted to show it to you. Uh, you see the seating, uh, nothing in there's changed. I think it had wallpaper because that's just bare plaster from maybe it had wallpaper. But it's a shame that this isn't in better it's usable conditions. And then that ten seat, that's what that is. Uh, this is the Rogues Harbor in, in Lansing, New York. Okay, this is a restaurant now. This is for private parties up there. And this one, I think, is especially in this is from a slide I took 30 years ago, so it's very poor to look at. But this, I received a, a call from a friend that said there's a house being rehabbed in the town of Caroline, which is way in the middle of nowhere, uh, southeast of Ithaca, all right? 
there's nothing there. And this was the Ross and Hollow Inn, and they, someone had bought this old house and was rehabbing it to live in. And this was the ballroom. You can see where it had the curved or vaulted elliptical ceiling. The seating on the walls, the paint was all the original paint from the 1830s or whatever. Okay. This is what really got me interested. I'm coming back to this. Uh, uh, these, these rooms were, were typically used for weddings and funerals and public meetings and harvest dinners and any time where you had to get people together and maybe it had been raining or it was cold, all right? But they weren't always open and a lot of these, the, the, the tavern or the inn was so valuable to the local community as a meeting place, um, but also had to be used as, as an inn. You see, both of these examples have drop down ceilings so that when it wasn't being used as a ballroom, they had a wall that dropped down to partition it off into a bedroom. So you can see that wall dropped down to the floor and the door through the wall. That was a common way to do that. Okay. You, uh, if you read uh, about the Morgan Exchange Coffee House, and, and a lot of historians have written about it, um, there was a wonderful ballroom three floors up that had a strong floor. Okay. And a lot of ours were three floors up too. Uh, I don't have a picture of that, it's gone now, but here is our Metropolitan Hotel in Hemlock, New York, New York that had a uh, third store, third story ballroom with a strong floor. Okay. Uh, Arch Merrill, who was our journalist that wrote books about everything around here says that 125 years ago there were five hotels on the main street in Hemlock. So uh, uh, I'm sure it was a lot going on. But I also, I'm going to come back to that, the design of that floor too. Here's one I really love. This was a hotel in Caledonia that, that later became the Masonic Hall. I have uh, not been to the I have not, it's up here, and I have not been to the third floor. I haven't seen it one of these days I'm going to. I'm told by local people it doesn't bounce anymore. Um, it doesn't look like a ballroom anymore, but I have to see it myself, all right? <laughs> uh, it's interesting. When, 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 one of the things I'm going to talk about in a few minutes is, was the technical achievement of the sprung floor for the enrichment or enhancement of the dancing, or was it to protect a lower plaster floor ceiling. Okay. Mm -hmm. To me, you have written proof here that the sprung floor was to enhance the dancing. Okay. Uh, it's been a marvel to all the <coughs> dance. Okay. Finding these references is hard. Okay, so what's the sprung floor? There we go. I'll read it. Structure built to provide a degree of spring or give to an otherwise rigid floor, uh, which increased dancing pleasure and in many cases pr protected an underlying plaster seat. The technique is believed to have come from England uh, and was common during the early history of our country and is mostly forgotten except for people like me. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, but <coughs> It's well known among dancers, modern dancers in the ballet dance, because they still build it. They still build it, all right? Uh, not to enhance the dancing now, but for the uh, protection of your knees and ankles and hip joints and your back. That's what I say. All right, they're made a little differently, but they still make them. Settled in Virginia. 
came in to change it. And then there was down here in uh, you know, um, New Orleans. Okay? Uh, so it, as I investigated this, what I learned was the sprung floor phenomenon sort of came from New England down through here. And then the canals and trains um, allowed it to, to go through the Midwest, out to the Upper West, and then it went into like California. Interestingly, it does not exist as far as I, I'm not saying there were never any, okay? But in this whole area of the South and the West, there's no indication they existed. So three times now, because I don't believe myself after the first time, I've called the Texas uh, Roadhouse Dance Association. I think that's what they're called, okay? And I've gotten a different person every time I've been told they absolutely don't exist in Texas. I've been told that three times, and I find it hard to believe because where, where there may have been a taboo of dancing in the South because of the Baptist and the Quakers or, or, or whoever else, <laughs> dancing is a big deal in Texas. Always has been. No sprung floors that I can find. Okay. So they moved in this area, and through here, all through that's, I, and what I, what I uh, want to read here is uh, Wisconsin Historical Society has written a whole lot about sprung floors, which is wonderful to find, okay? Um, I'll read this. Nearly everyone, save a few churches, enjoyed the diversion and sociability of dancing. Not only did they dance on rough floors of log taverns and upon spring floors in the more pretentious hostels, but in barns, breweries, and leafy groves. To the uninitiated, spring floors were a novelty, but they were at Buena Vista, at East Troy, the Smith Taverns, Tavern in McWongo, or in the, all the early taverns in Rochester, Waterford, Loganville, and other places. They were much more common, I think, than we, than, than we know. Um, I wanted to, to try and sort of figure out how they came to America. I had a difficult time with that, but I found sprung floors in Afghanistan, Australia, Canada, China, England, France, India, Ireland, Kenya, New Zealand, Nigeria, Scotland, Transylvania, South Africa, Sri Lanka, and Zimbabwe or Rhodesia. Uh, if you look at that list, it's mostly where English colonization took place. Okay? It seems to be an English thing. You can Google France for the rest of your life and not find a strong So now I want to move into what they were and how they worked, okay? Um, that's a strong floor. We almost never see a house like that. You know, as, as, a, as an old house guy, I go in house after house after house and they all sort of look the same. You know, the joists are on 16-inch centers, and some of them are bigger than others. And then every now and then you go in a house that belongs to someone who had a lot of money and it's built twice as good as all the others you go in. That's one of those. I, I don't, we never see houses built like that. But that would be a rigid floor, okay? And those are pocketed into these, that's a girt, but into the wall place like that. A rigid floor again normally won't bounce. This, this building has a very rigid floor. It would probably take 200 people to make this floor bounce. And if it did, it would bounce by accident, not, not, on, not, not on purpose. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Uh, there were dances in my hometown when I was a child. And uh, my father was the mayor. The community center was next door. The community center was the remainder of the old school building. The school building had been torn down. They left the gym, turned into the community center. But boy, it was well built. <coughs> and so there was going to be a rock and roll dance. And they hired a local entertainer who was reached locally famous, but not nationally famous. And in between the time he signed the contract to come and dance next door to my house and arriving for the dance, he scored a, he, he 
had a song that hit the air that made him internationally famous. Okay? Mm -hmm. The name of that song was Great Balls of Fire. Oh. Oh. And that was Jerry Lee Lewis. Yep. <laughs> so Jerry Lee Lewis comes to Halls, Tennessee after having reached international fame. My little town is 3,000 people. And my, father, my mother and father lived next door to a 1,000 square foot house. The, the community center is about from here to across the street. And dad's a mayor. Looking out the window, I wonder how many more people they could get in there. Okay, and so uh, the policeman called my dad and said, "There's too many people in here. We're afraid the floor is going to fall in. It's bouncing. All right, better call the fire marshal." So I was uh, five years old in 1957, and we were we were they they made people come out of the building. They were dancing in the yard out in front. I still remember dancing in the yard out in front of the building. Um, that was a floor that bounced by accident. <laughs> okay? And when, and when we build it, that was a floor that bounced by accident. But when, when we build a floor and we don't want it to flex, sometimes we put a girt in the middle. This is very heavy construction, okay? Those are very wide apart, but that would give that floor strength. Or we build it over a wall. Okay. That's to make a strong floor. Like this one. This has steel lightning on it. Alright. But let's take a modern floor. Alright, this this is in. Here's that same girt to keep it rigid. If we took that girt out, it would be less rigid. Uh, or if we took the girt out and we spaced these joists farther apart, it would be less rigid. <coughs> Or if we took the bird out and we made this distance across the room farther, it would be less rigid and it would be apt to bounce. I showed you the Hemlock Hotel dance floor on the third floor. Um, that the Hemlock Hotel had long joists that extended all the way up across the room. They were made out of pine, which was a little unusual, but pine as some people will say about wood and sprung floors, it was a wicked wood. It was a wicked wood and it allowed flex and that's why the sprung floor at the Hemlock Hotel bounced. Okay? Uh, but there, there are so many other reasons. So this is the weak floor. Most of most of the reasons they bounce is because of the weak floor. Uh, this this is this is too little. I can't really read that but this is this is a difficult concept, so let me just do the best I can. This is up in Vermont, Bethel, Vermont, middle of nowhere, on a rural country road, okay? And someone sent me here, and that's an old slide of mine. And here we have uh, the stable, and it's a wing off of the main tavern in the end, and the dance floor is up here, okay? You know, you can imagine getting to the tavern and in after traveling all day long in a wagon and it rained on you all day long. You know, this this would have been a welcome sight out in the middle of nowhere. You could have a meal, it might not be a good meal, it might be squirrel, but you don't have to cook it. And you have someone down here that can take care of your horses and mend your wagon if they need to. So it was a welcome sight. Here is the Locust Creek House, and here's the way the floor worked, okay? This is unusual. These are your beams for the building around the outside. And right inside that, there's another beam and another beam. And then there's joists or beams that go across that way. And they go a little too far, which would make them bounce. But then you see this girt underneath that would make those joists rigid. But the joist and the girts don't touch. They're rubber blocks. Rubber, rubber, or Gouda Percha was an early rubber, okay? Blocks right here underneath between those so that it could flex a little bit down on it and then that girt would stop it, all right? So here's the inside. This are the advanced floor beam, which is a little unusual. Here's the joist going across this way. Here's that, uh, here's that girt underneath these joists to stop it. And right here, you see they don't touch it, a big rubber blob under every one of those here. Here it is. 
that's about three inches and four inches. Okay? And that was to give resiliency to the, to the floor. I have read about more of these. You know, sometimes it was, uh, sometimes they were uh, elaborate descriptions of that type of tool, which I didn't quite understand, So, uh, but I know what they had. Um, the most common sprung floor technique in our area is called the double joist floor, okay? Miss um, Hollihan's house, Oliver Culver house, had a double joist floor. She was well aware of that. She had seen it. She had told me. Um, I just wish I could have seen it. So we know we had this double joist floor at the J.C. Smith Cobblestone in Wisconsin. Uh, because this drawing appeared in Yankee Magazine about 40 years ago. Okay. Uh, this is a, a half historical American building survey drawing. And so let's look at this. This was the ballroom on the third floor up in here. All right. Here's a dive, here's a drawing of the floor. And you see that odd domino look right there? Those are the joists. You have joists that hold the floor. Joist the hold the ceiling below. That way, if the floor moves, it won't break the plaster down below. So the question is, did they build a double joist only to protect the plaster, or did it also enhance the dancing? Okay. It, mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, I already mentioned that. This, this Hollyhead's house had one of this is the Beach Tavern down in, I uh, always have 64 going to <coughs> Naples at 5 and 20. Um, this house is remarkable for things beside the sprung floor. Um, uh, this house had every room was hand painted. The walls were hand painted with, with, with freehand and stencil light paintings. And the, and the ballroom had a whole wall mural of Albany Harbor, it's believed. Uh, most of that's been covered up now, but I think the current owners left one little panel in every room by an opening where you can see the painting. It's spectacular. Um, but this was an 1800 stage stop, all right? And so the owners called, I didn't know this, first they called John Barrow down uh, to look at the floor. And this is what he, or he came back to his office, and this is how he drew that floor, okay? So you have floor supported by these joys and the ceiling below by these joys. I went down in 1994 and I recorded it this way. I think mine's right. Uh, it's maybe a little closer to right with this like this. Okay. That plank only holds the ceiling while this <coughs> this uh, joist had to hold the weight of the dance floor. I looked at the way it was pocketed into the wall. I couldn't see anything unusual, but I'm looking at it, you know, through a hole in the floor and down with a flashlight. I don't know if it was just to protect the ceiling or if it was a spring. I, I don't know that. Probably never will know that. But here's a completely different example. This is the Oliver Loud Tavern, which was in Egypt at Loud Road, Highway 31. Uh, and here it is today. It was moved in about 1985, I think, and uh, rehabbed about 10 years ago or 15 years ago. It's really pretty. That's on the Erie Canal, which was basically. So a friend of mine was working in this house and said, I need to come out here and look. It had a ball. Okay. And these were my these were my field drawings. I can't draw. Can't at all. These were my field drawings. You'll see I had a joist for them holding up the dance floor and a separate joist holding up ceiling below. Here's how a joist is normally pocketed in, okay? And that's how the lower ceiling joist will pocket just typically into the beams. But look how the dance floor joist were pocketed into the wall beams, okay? Do you see that? They were made to slide down when you danced on that floor, okay? In this case, I absolutely know that that floor was made to enhance the dancing. 
and not simply to protect the lower plaster seal. So it achieved both purposes. The ceiling below, the ceiling below was uh, kept rigid because it doesn't take much to break the plaster ceiling. And yet the upper floor was able to flex. Okay. This is this is hard to see. This is it. All of that was put in to make the floor not flex anymore. The, you know, to defeat the spring floor. But what you had was uh, you had a, a board. These were on 24 inch centers. That's that's way wide. That's another reason the floor bounced so much. Okay. Uh, but here's the important slide. Here's that floor joist pocketed into the beam in a way that made it very weak and made it able to move. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, the popularity of the sprung floor carried on. It, it, it's not just an 18th and 19th century phenomenon. Uh, here, here in 1900 is a picture from Frank Kidder's construction book. Uh, he did not talk about enhancing the dancing. He talked about protecting that ceiling below very clear. He also said this is one of the stupidest things a builder could do in a building because it created a fire channel. Okay. All right. Uh, here's another one from 1908 where, where they had some sort of proprietary metal spring between the two. I, I've never seen that. I'd like to. The, the other reason you know that Mr. Kidder's design was not meant for enhancement of the dancing. If it were, he probably wouldn't have put these braces in there. This is a basket weave sprung floor, okay? So go back to an earlier slide, Hamilton Hall, Salem, Massachusetts, Samuel McIntyre. That floor is, is a basket weave floor. Uh, so that was, that was I think it's said 185, 187 when that building was built. So 100 years later, here's a guy patents the same system. All right, and here is a modern. They're still doing this in modern dance uh, dance rooms, dance floors. Okay? Still done. There's a lot of other ways they do it with, with uh, rubber or resilient pads. If, if you Google sprung floors, this is what you get. This is my favorite example. This is what took me down this stupid path. Uh, a friend of mine who salvages old building materials looked at this house. This is the Rawson Hollow Inn in Carolina. I already mentioned it to you. And he said, I, I, I was uh, asked to, to come out and, and look at this building. And he said, I've never seen anything like it. And so I drove all the way from Rochester over there one day to look at it. Um, this was on a stage coast. Stagecoach line, it was an inn, tavern, stagecoach stop in the middle of nowhere, okay? Like I said, south, southeast of, of Ithaca. It was rehabbed in a Greek re revival in like 1840, but uh, before that it was a federal style house. Uh, this is the dance floor that I, this is the ballroom that I saw. You can see it had the elliptical arch ceiling, uh, it still had the benches on the wall, it had the original paint. This was looking um, west, and then this was looking east, and go back. Uh, the ballroom went from the, this one to right here, and there was a wall right there. But which makes me think there could have been a that could have been where the modernization of the house took place in the 1840s. But this is the ballroom. Okay. He said, "You've never seen a floor like this." So the floor joist that went all the way across uh, looked like that. Each one of them had a lenticular arch cut out of the center of it. And I've had two engineers and several architects look at this and they just can't believe it. They can't believe it didn't break. Uh, they can't believe it didn't collapse, and some of them did collapse. I think the one at the Rawson Hollow, well, I'll, I'll go back to that. This is Rawson Hollow. And this, the lenticular arch, uh, was, was common. It was common in buildings. Here's a lenticular truss bridge, okay? Same thing, but here, here we go, all right? 
I jumped up and down on that and it moved, but I think it might have taken several people. On the other hand, if I went into Miss Hollihan's home, the old Oliver Culver house, I felt drunk, drunk, even <laughs> alone in the middle of that floor. It was uneven. <laughs> now that I've said that, I want to read something to you. Uh, How many people have danced or stood or jumped on them? You have. I have. <laughs> well, uh, in, in English account says, uh, it's on elastic springs, so when you dance, you're apt to think you're fluttering on wings. <laughs> of the Wyoming Elf Mountain House, if you can't dance, just jump on it and ride. <laughs> Another account. They yielded under the feet of the dancers like thin ice. Persons unaccustomed to them or somewhat inebriated would be liable to fall. I felt as if I were walking on a cloud. The floor was springy and transformed my footfall into a nothing of effortlessness. Arch Merrill, again, our local journalist who wrote so many books, says, of Richardson's Canal House in Bushels Basin. It was a famous canal hotel with a spring dance floor that swayed to tripping feet. And to bring this up to date, uh, Eric Clapton wrote about one in the not, built in the 1920s era in England. It was called the El Pie Dance Floor. It's on an island in the middle of the Thames River, okay? And became a popular venue for rock and roll concerts. He said, it would bounce up and down somewhat. You didn't have to dance. It would go six or seven inches up in the air. Okay. So that's what it felt like, I guess. Here's that Ross and Hollow Man, the lenticular arch. There they are. There's those holes cut out. See that? There's that cut out. Not a good picture, I'm sorry. Goodness. But <laughs> the tile that worked. Yeah, it would have been cut out of the end. This is the Rose Harbor Inn, which was originally the Central Exchange in Lansing, New York. Okay, that's a you know, nice picture from probably the 1880s or something. Here's the uh, third or fourth ballroom today. It had that same lenticular arch. Okay, it's well recorded. I read, I read more than one account about dance floors that were suspended by cables. And I assume this is what that meant. This is a common trussing technique. Uh, 20 years ago, I visited a man's house in Lima. And he was painting his house. And I saw a plank suspended between two ladders that he was walking on. I'd never seen anything like it. And I said, what is that? And he said, well, it's been in the garage. I use it every time I paint. And it was a walk, walk board that you would, you know, that you would extend between two ladders to walk on. And it was made exactly like that. So that when you stepped out in the middle of that plank and you, and you thought it might bend, then your weight straightened it up. It was interesting how it worked. But I think we the floors that were cable probably work like that. I've heard accounts of weak floors, floors on old Dodge truck springs, old wagon springs, which would be a leaf spring. They are said they say the Minden Hotel in Minden had that. I don't know. Beams with loose pins, floors suspended from the ceiling. This is a good one. Hundreds or thousands of tennis balls under the floor. That wasn't true. For sure. <laughs> Old tires filled with horse hair under uh -huh. the floor. I think that one was true. Uh -huh. Ball bearings, springs of bent timbers. There, I read a couple of accounts of that. If you if you cut your joists so they were arched, cambered in the middle, and and you made them too long. 
and they were bounced. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the examples here, though, really intrigued me, but I just wrote it off. Springs and levers with adjustment handles. The more people there, the more it would bounce, and you could adjust it with handles on the wall. I thought, well, that's a stupid thing. <laughs> So here's a, here's a patent for coil springs, 1877. Oh my goodness. These exist. I've seen pictures of them. My pictures were way too bad to, to, to put on here. Okay? People take pictures in a basement area and then you, they, they don't come out very well. All right? Here's a 1934 patent for almost the same thing, except you see the screw threads on there? Not, not only did you have the helical spring, but you had a thread to adjust the spring. I guess depending on how many people were on it. Okay. This one is famous in the Northwest. The crystal ball run is still in existence. The sprung floor is still there. It, I don't understand this floor. There are ball bearings this big under the floor, and there's metal over it and the tension springs that allow the floor to do this. I don't understand it at all. National Public Radio did a story about this floor about three years ago. I nearly had a wreck uh, when, when, I, when I heard the story. <laughs> so I said to you, I didn't believe the arm in the wall, adjust the tension. Well, there it is. Morton's patent, ball torque sprung floor system. This existed through the first half of the 20th century. Every public dance hall in England almost has one of these in it. And there are thousands of them. Dancing was a real big deal in India and in England up until the 1960s, I think. But especially during the World War II years. From World War I, just past World War II, every town has a dancing venue. And sometimes they're in churches, sometimes they're in a town hall, and sometimes they're in church hall. There's lots and lots of them, okay? There's that handle. There really, really was a handle, more than one in the room, where they could adjust the tension of the floor. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the end of my presentation. I, I, uh, I can answer any of your questions, maybe. And if you have examples that you want to tell me about or write down for me, I will appreciate that. So, and I'll carry on, okay? <laughs> Uh, but thank you for coming. Thank you, Steve.
So let's talk about this. That looks like a, a hefty floor joist. It's not as deep as we would want one today by code, but it's wide. But what most people don't get is the strength of that floor joist is not from there to there. Not when you, well, not when you do this and you cut it to go in that pocket. The strength is from here to here. And so when, when you've decreased the strength and then you cut that that arch out that ends like maybe here, that you would think that it would crack along here. Mm -hmm. uh, it would shear. I mean, yeah. I mean, every, every engineer and architect that looked at those pictures told me, I think it's impossible. But, but there was not a single crack in those joists. They were perfect. They were hardwood. I don't know what kind of hardwood. Uh, my time there was brief. Uh, but I think they did collapse at the Rose Harbor Inn. I think they did collapse there, okay? Because the floor has a marked sway in the middle. But it would seem that the, um, the town of Caroline and the Lansing one are close enough together that the same carpenter may have... As, absolutely, or one and learned, learned from the other. Mm -hmm. That would be nice to know, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. My, this... my thought about the town of Caroline line is, of course, it, it's hard to look at something in, in our eyes and really view it appropriately. But my guess is they probably had to bring people there to stay to build that to build that building because there was absolutely nothing there. <coughs> never has been. Mm -hmm. So they probably brought people in, and that would that would further. Uh, maybe prove that hmm. the same same guy or somebody who knew somebody. Is this a skill that any carpenter would I know? I think it was a carpenter. Texas, a lot of those early buildings 
stone, that real thick stone was an insulator. And often they didn't have two stories. If they did, it was a wall. You, you could have had a strong floor on the first floor, and I, I have read a lot of examples of that, but right. it's not nearly as common. And you're right, all those Texas dance halls are first floor. Almost all of them. The stone didn't affect the side. Well, if you if you stretch your joist out far enough, it doesn't matter. It won't bounce. There's one in there's one in there was one in Montana that I read about at, uh, Elk Mountain House that that said that uh, it was made out of log joists that were that were stretched to the maximum amount, you know, that wouldn't break, and that's why it bounced so much. And it was on the first floor. Thank you for coming. You could have been right in your yard.